All right, if you would please be seated, get out your Bibles, and open up to 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So, yeah, some of us came to church, right, Seth, a little bit, yeah. uh, little bit blue, shall we say, okay, from the outcome of last night's endeavors. But we, you know, for me, I find solace in the fact that the Cubs are still 25 games over 500, so we're good. All right, but more importantly, we are here this morning to study God's Word together, not me give you the update on the sporting report, okay? And I'm sure we can all say amen to that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, we're getting very close to the end of the book, and it's my intention that we will finish 1 Corinthians next Sunday. There are just a few more things to kind of discuss as we wind this down and, and, and look toward the end. And uh, as I said, there's a lot of things that are going to be happening next Sunday, uh, one of which is going to be the conclusion of our study on 1 Corinthians. I've already mentioned in passing last week that where I'm going next or uh, where I'm heading next as far as what we're going to talk about or preach about is going to be a series that I'm going to entitle Bodybuilding. And it's going to be about building the body of Christ and, and, and what Paul has to say in his epistle specifically. So it's my intent to preach topically for a while when we're done with this expository study of the book of 1 Corinthians. But to get through that, we have this Sunday and one more, two more studies that we need to make sure that we get through. So let's just jump right into this. Let's read together uh, verses 15 through 18 and then have a word of prayer and we'll begin the message. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus. I don't really know how to pronounce that guy's name, so that's what I'm saying. Uh, for that, for, excuse me, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Lord, thank you again for this time that we could spend together in your word. We pray that it would be time of uh, edification and growth for us as members of the church, the body of Christ, and that we would get the profit out of these, uh, this portion of scripture that you put here for us. We're grateful for this time and for our, uh, your son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again and offers us salvation simply by justification, by grace through faith. We are grateful for the, the simple truth and the simplicity of the gospel this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So last Sunday we looked at verses uh, 13 and 14 where we saw those five imperatives, right? And we, we, we talked about parting imperatives for the Corinthians, and he says in verse 13, number one, watch ye. Number two, stand fast in the faith. Number three, quit you, like, quit you like men. Number four, be strong. And number five, let all your things be done with charity. And I kind of talked about how you've got these sort of man, these, these manly things that you're supposed to be doing in verse 13 of watching and standing fast and, and quitting, quit you like men. That means man up, be brave, okay? Uh, be strong, but while you're doing that, you're supposed to do these things with what? Charity in verse 14. And so we looked at those things last Sunday. As Paul is winding things down now, he is going to say a few more things, mention some people, say some things about these people and, uh, and what their uh, relationship was to him and how they were ministering with him or to him and what have you. And we just want to make some observations here this Sunday about the issue of fellow laboring, co-working in the work of the ministry, being helpers, um, in the work of the ministry. And we see this starting in verse 15. Now, when we get to verse 15, you need to notice the structure here, okay? He says, I beseech you, brethren, and then you get a parenthesis, okay? There's a parenthetical insertion in verse 15 where he says, Ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, ending of the parenthesis. Verse 16, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Okay, So there's something that we need to note right off the bat about sort of the way these, these verses are structured here. So what I want to do is I want to read verse 15, I want to skip the parenthesis, and I want to read straight into verse 16. Okay, Because Paul digresses, within the parenthesis, Paul digresses to give an example of what he's talking about. Okay, He's going to give them an example of, of, of what he's talking about and what he's beseeching them unto. And he says in verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, 
parenthesis, verse 16, that ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Okay? So if you read verse 15 into 16, for the time being, skipping the parenthesis, the thing that Paul is beseeching them unto in verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, verse 16, that ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with, uh, helpeth with us and laboreth. So what Paul is doing is he's beseeching the Corinthians to submit themselves to the co-laborers in the ministry that are laboring with Paul. Those who are, as he says in verse 16, those who helpeth with us, and at the end, and laboreth. So Paul is, is, is saying to the Corinthians, he's beseeching them, he's imploring them, he's begging them here, okay, that they submit themselves in this way unto those that helpeth with us and laboreth, okay? Now, the parenthesis there in verse 15 is a particular exa example, if you will, of what he is beseeching them to acknowledge or beseeching them to submit themselves to. So it's an example of what he is, the course of action or conduct that he wants the Corinthians to follow. So let's look inside that parenthesis now for, for a little bit, and then we'll come back to some other things in verses 15 and 16 uh, in a moment. But look at what he says inside the parenthesis. He says, ye know the house of Stephanus. So, do the Corinthians know Stephanus? Do they know his family? Okay? So, notice what else he says. He says, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia. Now, when I look at that phrase, the way I understand that phrase is that the, the, the phrase, the first fruits of Achaia, is that when Paul went into Achaia, the first family, the first household, the first group, if you will, to hear Paul's, pre uh, Paul's preaching and respond to a bit, excuse me, and respond to it favorably is the household of Stephanus. He calls them the first fruits of Achaia. So I take that to mean that, that Achaia, that in the, in the region of Achaia, the first family that heard Paul's preaching believed it and responded favorably to it, is the household of Stephanus. And so therefore Paul uh, says that they are the first fruits of Achaia. Now, Stephanus is a name that you should remember from previous studies. Come back to chapter 1. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you recall, in, in chapter 1, Paul is uh, having a discussion or saying some things uh, about pertaining to water baptism, and he mentions the a uh, few people that he baptized in Corinth, okay? Uh, look with me at verse um, 13. He says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Now watch, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, okay? So that's two guys. Lest, so there's a reason why he did this, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name, and I baptize also the household of who? Stephanus, okay? Besides that, I know not whether I baptized any other. So my point this morning is not to give a big, long sermon about baptism and all of those kinds of things, okay? That's not what I'm after. I want you to see, though, that in the first chapter of the book, does Paul mention Stephanus and his household? In the last chapter of the book, is Paul mentioning Stephanus and his household? Okay, so in, the, in that way is sort of a, an interesting thing, almost like bookends here, okay? A mention in the very beginning, first chapter, a mention in the very ending, in the 16th chapter. But he says there in, in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 16, he says, And I baptize the household of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptize any other. So the idea that Paul, you know, we could... Paul is not boasting in this passage, chapter 1, about how many people he baptized. In fact, he's, he, he's downplaying that issue and what happened with that issue in Corinth. But he's, the household of Stephanus is mentioned there as one of the few that Paul did baptize. So come back to chapter 16. Come back to chapter 16, and, and we are looking at verse 15 inside the parenthesis. So, number one, the Corinthians know the house of Stephanus. Number two, they should know that the house of Stephanus is the first fruits of the Caia. So they are the first family and household to respond favorably to Paul's preaching in the geographic region of Achaia. Okay? Now there's a third thing he says here in verse 15. And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Interesting. Most of the time when we think about addictions, 
we don't think about positive things. Okay? We think maybe about chemical addictions, drugs, cigarettes, alcohol, these kinds of things. We think about addiction in negative terms, right? That people are addicted to, you know, pornography, for example, or something along those lines, right? And we think about addiction not in a favorable way, not in a positive way, not in a way that is beneficial to a member of the body of Christ, but yet here we see God the Holy Spirit using the word addicted, and He's, he's explicitly using that concept here as as a reference to people who have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So in this, in this context here, would addiction be a positive thing or a negative thing? This would be a positive addiction, right? This would be an addiction to something that's, that's good. You know, I, I, I've been reading some things in preparation for our Bible conference about different things, and what they say is that if you have an addiction, that what you need to do is replace that addiction with something else. And I was having a conversation recently um, with, a, with another member of the body of Christ about some, some different things, and, and we were talking about uh, a few of these things, and he mentioned that he had an employee that worked for him who had an extreme addiction to heroin. And he went to rehab, and he did all this stuff and, and so forth, and what he did, what this guy does now, is he goes home every night and spends three hours building Legos. Okay. This is what he does. So he, 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 the way that he occupies the mental space and the mental energy that he used to devote towards trying to get his fix and get his drugs and do all that kind of thing, he has now replaced that with something else. He builds Legos. So this is a 40-some-year-old man who goes home every night and spends the whole evening replacing Legos. The, the, the thing with that is, though, is... Obviously, is building Legos more of a productive activity than doing heroin? Okay? But is there any real spiritual value in building Legos? Okay? So, what, what, my point is you can change and exchange one flavor of flesh for another flavor of flesh, right? But if you don't have somewhere in that process God's Word, and God's Word, and a meditation upon God's Word, and a, and, and a, and a thinking about God's Word in the, in the forefront or the tip of your mind, you can change certain things about your life, but it's just going to be you what? It's just going to be you changing stuff. It's like you're just shifting around the deck chairs, right? You're not really, you want to bring about real change. You want to bring about spiritual life and vitality. You're going to have to let it be the Word of God that's going to, that's going to dwell in you richly. It's going to be the Word of God that you're going to have to meditate upon, that you're going to have to think about, that is going to rewire that, the way that you think about things in your brain. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole big thing about this because I'm going to preach for this uh, on this topic uh, in the Bible conference uh, coming up. But I am, I, am becoming to see, I am beginning to see the idea when Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he talks about, he says that you're transformed by the renewing of what? Your mind. You understand that your mind and your brain are not the same thing. Now, if you're a materialist, if you are an evolutionary, atheistic materialist, and you believe that the only thing that exists is what? Matter and flesh and so forth, then you think the only thing that exists is your what? Brain, right? You know that the Word of God never one time, go home and look it up, search it with your Bible software, the Word of God never mentions your brain. But you have one, don't you? But the, the Word of God has a lot to say about your mind. Okay, so there's a re the renewing of the mind is going to bring about a transformation. The Greek word that's translated transformation in Romans 12, 2 is the word metamorphosis, right? So when you renew your mind, there's something that is happening. And I'm going to stop there. I just sort of wet your whistle on that a little bit. But it is related to this issue of addiction, right? People can be addicted to things that are destructive. They can switch out a destructive add addiction for some other thing like Legos, Right? So I used to be addicted to Diet Coke. Serious. I was drinking inordinate amounts of Diet Coke. And finally, everything I ate started tasting like metal. So I said to Becky, I'm like, this isn't good. I should probably stop this. So I just stopped drinking Diet Coke. Just like that. Boom. Cold turkey stopped drinking Diet Coke. But then I got headaches. And I was crabby. And I was irritable, and she couldn't live with me because I, 
I'm exaggerating, of course, but not about the crabbiness. And so finally one day I said to her, I'm like, all right, make me a cup of coffee in the morning. Okay? So now I'm addicted to coffee. Now I'm addicted to coffee. I drink as much coffee as I used to drink Diet Coke. And now my wife's trying to get me addicted to kombucha. All right? Oh, yeah, kombucha. The... Uh, Craig and Carrie, are, 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 we're having a kombucha party. They're going to teach us how to grow this stuff, okay? But anyway, yeah, you, you can switch out one addiction for another addiction. You can switch out one thing in the power of your own flesh. But this verse is talking about people who had addicted themselves to what? Ministry. They had addicted themselves to something positive. They had addicted themselves to something that was beneficial in their life, that was productive in their life, that was, that, 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 that was moving them in a, in, a, in a governing principle of their household. Okay? Now, we're addicted to a lot of things in this country, right? Not, not all of them are bad, but a lot of them are distracting us away from, from, from the Scripture. They're distracting us away from, from ministry and from, from being um, uh, more active in the body of Christ and these kinds of things. So the idea here where it says they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. If you look up the word... So I went all the way back to the Oxford English Dictionary on this one because I was not finding anything that I thought was too helpful, right? The Oxford English Dictionary, the OED... It's, three, it's like two volumes. They're this big. If you, have a, if you have a hard copy, you have to pull the drawer out and take out the little magnifying glass just to read because the print's so small. So I recommend an online subscription, by the way. And, uh, and go to the public library. Now I'm giving you a commercial. If you go to the public library, you can probably use your library card to sign on for free to the OED. But anyway, that's what I do. So the idea of being addicted, it says here, the meaning here is to practice devotion to an occupation, activity, or object. So, can you be addicted to baseball? Can you be addicted to NASCAR? Can you be addicted to quilting or growing kombucha or any old thing, Legos, or whatever your thing is. Can you be addicted to anything? If we're fi defining addiction as the practice of devotion to an occupation, activity, or object. You could be addicted to your job, okay? You could be addicted to just about anything, right? So the idea here is to practice devotion to an occupation, activity, or object. And then there's a sub-definition, right? And it says this, to dedicate or devote oneself. That's the same thing. To dedicate or devote oneself to an occupation, activity, or object. And then it says, now rare and archaic. But then the dictionary gives you, the Oxford English Dictionary gives you 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15, as an example of this use of the word. Okay? So again, when I'm talking about addiction, when we're talking about addiction, we almost always think about things that are what? Bad, negative, bad for you, harmful to you, right? These, these kinds of things. Consuming of your time. Oh, yeah, you could be addicted to video games. I won't bring that one up, okay? You could be addicted to video games. You could be addicted to anything. But this verse is using this dedication, this devotion, not in a negative way towards something that's harmful or distracting, but it's using it in a positive way towards something that is beneficial spiritually. And he says in the verse, verse 15 that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of who? The saints. So the household of Stephanus, then, if I'm using the definitions, is practicing devotion to the ministry of the saints. Okay? They are seeking out an opportunity to minister to the saints. They are addicted to the ministry of the saints according to what the verse is saying. This is not a negative addiction. This is not a meaningful, useless addiction. This is an addiction to something spiritually beneficial and positive. Now, not only for the household of Stephanus, but also for who? The saints, the rest of the church, the body of Christ, right? So here we see an example here of Paul as he is beseeching the Corinthians to submit themselves unto, unto them that are such, and then he gives the example to them of the household of Stephanus. Now think about that for a minute, okay? Why would that be a powerful example to the Corinthians of what Paul is beseeching them to? 
Do they know Stephanus and his household? Do they know that Stephanus was the fir- and his household were the first fruits of Achaia? And have they experienced, hopefully, probably, no doubt, the benefits of the addiction that Stephanus and his household had toward the saints and the ministry of the saints? And so now what he's doing, with that in mind, okay, with that sort of backdrop in mind, now let's go and read again, skipping the parentheses. He says, I beseech you, brethren... Then you have the parenthesis about, about Stephanus and his household. Okay. Then skipping to verse 16, I beseech you, brethren, that you submit yourselves unto them that are such. Okay. So obviously, he wants them to submit them to folks who are thinking like, operating like, and behaving like Stephanus and his household. Okay. So how was Stephanus and his household operating? They were operating in a way that they had addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Paul wants the Corinthians to respect those saints. Okay, He wants the Corinthians to submit themselves unto these saints, or saints that are like Stephanus and his household. He says, I beseech you, brethren, in verse 15, ver- uh, skipping the parentheses, verse 16, that you submit yourselves unto them that are such. So, and then it says, and, so not only, not only to those that are like Stephanus, okay, and to everyone that helpeth with us, okay? So, it's not just Stephanus and his household, it's other people who are helping Paul do the work of the ministry that he wants the Corinthians to submit to, okay? Now, the whole idea of submission, we're going to have a wedding here in a few days, And in the wedding, I'm going to read the text from Ephesians chapter 5 about wives submitting unto their husbands and and, and the husbands submitting to Christ and all this sort of thing. And every time I do a wedding, there's somebody sitting in 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 the audience who's like, I'm not going to do that. How could you say that? Well, submission is the idea of putting the benefit of somebody else before yourself, right? He wants them to submit to these people. These people are doing something that is good. These people are doing something that is beneficial to the spiritual fitness and well-being of of the Corinthians. And Paul says, Submit unto them that are such, in verse 16, and to everyone that helpeth with us. Okay? Now, that would include, already, even right here in this chapter, just go back just quick and look at verse um, 10. (coughs) <coughs> Just go back quick and look at verse 10. He says, Now if Timotheus come, see, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as also do I. Would Timothy be another example of one of these types of people that are laboring with Paul that he would want the Corinthians to submit to? Okay, So we see this, we see this a lot here as Paul is concluding this epistle. Now, the idea, go, so look in verse 16 that ye submit yourselves unto, unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us. I want to spend some time talking about that word, that, that phrase there, helpeth with us. Okay, That phrase is an interesting phrase. So come with me here, if you would. Hold your hand here and come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look with me at verse 1. So, in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 16, he's talking about to everyone that helpeth with us. Now think about that, okay? The us, to me, is obviously a reference to Paul and those that are are working with him and so forth. But you could do something by yourself, or you could do something together with other people, right? Right? If you do something by yourself, you're, you're doing it solo, right? You're off doing your own thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing or whatever. That's not my point. But if you're doing it with others, you're doing it in a, in a, in a, in a, fellow, in a fellowship, if you will, okay? You're doing it in a way where you're laboring together. You're helping each other. You're striving together, uh, so to speak, for the same thing, right? And so he says there in verse 16, and to everyone that helpeth with us. Well, the same idea is in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1. Notice what it says. It says, we then as, notice, workers, how? Together with Him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. 
Now, do you see there in chapter 6, verse 1, the phrase workers together? The phrase workers together is a translation of the same word that's translated helpeth with us in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 16. So to, to, to help with is the idea of to work together. Okay, It's the idea of, I'm not just going to go off here and do this thing by myself as though I could in my own effort and my own energy. No, it's the idea that I'm going to need other people, and in, in, when I get these other people, we're going to have to help each other. We're going to have to work out. We're going to have to work together. Okay, Let's look at a few more things about this. Come over, get two passages with me. Get Colossians chapter 4 in one hand. Get Colossians chapter 4 in one hand, and get the book of Philemon in the other. So get Colossians 4 in one hand and get Philemon in the other. Okay? Colossians 4 and Philemon. <clears throat> Brother Nate was talking just this morning about some things related to uh, some different points about how the body of Christ needs each other, right? Um, how many have ever seen that show or watched the movie The Lone Ranger? The Lone Ranger is the idea that this guy's going to go out there by himself and take care of all this stuff, right? Okay. Was Paul a Lone Ranger? No. Paul was not a Lone Ranger. Did Paul have a whole bunch of people that were helping him, that were working together with him, that were laboring together with him, that were helping alongside of him, right? Most of them probably never get mentioned in Scripture, right? Look at Colossians chapter 4. Look at Colossians chapter 4. Look with me at verse 7. <laughs> he says here, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister, now watch, and a fellow what? Servant in the Lord. Okay? Now what is a fellow servant? A servant is somebody who serves alongside. Right? serves with, helps out, works together with you. You're not doing it all on your own. They're not doing it on their own. Rather, you're doing it how? Together. Go to Philemon. <coughs> Go to Philemon. Verse 1. Philemon, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, now watch, and fellow laborer. Okay? Now, in Colossians chapter 4, Tychicus is described as a fellow what? Servant. Here, Philemon is described as a fellow laborer, right? Those two words, fellow servant and fellow laborer, are a translation of the same underlying word, right? They have the idea of working with, working alongside. It means the idea of co-laborer, companion in labor, or helper, right? So somebody... So the idea here is you're going to do it together. You're going to, you're going to come alongside each other as members of the church, the body of Christ, and you're going, to, you're going to help each other out. You're going to work together in the ministry for the benefit of the body of Christ. This is the concept here. Paul calls Tychicus a fellow servant. He calls Philemon here a fellow laborer. They are referring to the same concept. Those who are companions in labor, helpers in labor, or those who are laboring together to accomplish a, a, a particular task. Philemon was a helper of Paul. Okay, He helped him carry on the work of the ministry. Paul was in prison in Rome when the book of Philemon is written and viewed the work that Philemon was doing as essential and benefiting the work of the ministry. Paul is in, Paul, when Paul writes Philemon, he's in house arrest in Rome. Okay. While he's in under house arrest in Rome, is Paul still conducting ministry where he's at? But is there still a whole bunch of other ministry that needs to be conducted outside of Rome in all the churches that Paul established on his apostolic journeys, right? The only way that happened, Paul can't be everywhere at one time. That's why when he goes out, he got folks saved and he, he educated them and, 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 and taught them sound doctrine. And then he enlisted elders to oversee those assemblies and so forth. Well, Philemon is one of these guys. Philemon is a guy that Paul views as a fellow laborer in the ministry. He was helping Paul out. He was beneficial to the ministry. Even though Paul was in prison, Philemon was doing ministry where he was. He's a fellow laborer with Paul in the ministry. Okay. Now let me just ask you a very simple question. 
Does Paul need these kind of people? Without these kind of people, without, without the Tychicuses, Tychicuses? I don't know if that's right. The Philemons, the uh, household of Stephanus, without these saints who have made this choice to serve the work of the ministry and serve the Lord together in that ministry, okay, without this happening, is the ministry going to be able to continue? So Paul is going to need these people. Come over to Romans 16. Or no, yeah, Romans chapter 16. <clears throat> Romans chapter 16. <coughs> Let's start reading at verse 1. Okay, then as we read through here, I'm going to stop at a few different places and make a couple comments and ask you to think about a few things that we're reading. Okay, Romans chapter 16, verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a what? Servant. So here's a female saint who Paul calls a what? A servant of the church, which is at, which is at Centuria. That ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ. Okay? Everybody see the word helpers there in verse 3. That word helpers, that's the same word that's translated fellow laborers. That's the same word that's translated fellow servant. Okay? So what is a helper? A helper is a fellow laborer, is a fellow servant. What is a fellow servant? A fellow servant is a fellow laborer or a what? Helper. You get the picture, right? Okay. So he says that these folks are his helpers in Christ. Verse 4. As we go through here, think about all the different people that Paul's mentioning. Verse 4. Speaking still about Priscilla and Aquila, who have laid... Uh, excuse me, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles. So here are two people who did something, okay, of such significance and magnitude that Paul is saying all the churches of the Gentiles benefited from what these two have done in that they, were, that, in that they would have laid down their old life for the Apostle Paul. Okay? And whatever that was, I don't know for sure what it was, whatever their actions and behavior was there, Paul views it as being beneficial not just to the Romans, but to all the churches of, of who? Of the Gentiles, he says there at the end of verse 4. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved um, Eponidas, and the, uh, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ, Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute uh, I am Andromachus and Juna, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are who are of not who are of note, excuse me, among the apostles, who also were beloved in Christ before me. Greet Epaphanius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. How many times are these people being described as helpers in Christ, fellow laborers, fellow prisoners, all this kind of language, laboring with us kind of kind of language? Okay. Verse 10, salute Apelles, uh, approved in Christ. Salute them uh, that are of, um, whatever that guy's name is, household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that are of, of the household of uh, Narcius, uh, which, uh, which are in the Lord. Salute Trephania and, and, and tri, uh, tri, tri, Triposa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Purvis which labored much in the Lord, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. You get the point, right? How many different people is he mentioning? A bunch of them, right? Craig's already done the math, but if you add up all the number of names here, okay, in this passage from verse 3 to verse 22, there are, there are 31 different people that he names. Specifically names. When he names them, they are all named within the context of having helped Paul or the ministry in some capacity. Greet this guy who did this and that guy who did this and say hi, and, and sister so-and-so and this and that, right? You understand what he's doing. 31 times, 30 different people are mentioned by name here in this passage, okay? Now, I, did, I, I took it a step further and I found every occurrence 
of the Greek word here that is translated fellow laborer, helper, or, or fellow laborer, and this is not, okay, don't hold me to this math. I might have added wrong, okay? But I counted at least 45 people that Paul mentions as being fellow laborers with him and partners in the ministry. So you've got 31 right there in Romans. If you take that, that word that's translated, you're going to come up with at least 45. It, it's probably more. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a math guy, okay? But this number doesn't even count all the other people that Paul no doubt had contacts with and just never what? Just never mentioned. Come back with me to 1 Corinthians 16. Folks, the success of Paul's ministry was because there were people who got saved from, his, saved from hearing his preaching. They believed the message that he was sharing with them. And they were willing to partner with Paul in ministry. Okay? They were willing to do the work. They were, really, they were willing to be a part of it. And he, he mentions these people here and there throughout the epistles. Verse 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 16. That ye submit yourselves unto them, su submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Paul's ministry, I've thought about this. Seems to me that Paul's ministry was a success for three primary reasons. Okay? Number, reason number one, he had a purpose. Okay, he knew what he was doing. His purpose was to have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay? His purpose was to establish local grace assemblies. Assemblies who knew that they were not under the law, who knew their justification was not according to the law, who knew who they were in Christ. He, his purpose was to have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth and to see, Ephesians 3, the fellowship of the mystery. Okay? So he's got a purpose. He's not out here, oh, gee, what should I do? That wasn't, his, that, that wasn't how he functioned. So number one, he had a purpose. Number two, he had a strategy. His strategy was to target and establish independent churches in the urban, regional centers of population in the Roman Empire. And once he had established churches in these, in these uh, strategically placed cities throughout the Roman Empire, he was able to therefore reach out into the surrounding areas by setting up local functioning churches and assemblies in those areas. So he had a purpose and he had a strategy. Okay? But number three, he can't do any of this if he doesn't have any what? Fellow laborers. He cannot execute the strategy... He cannot, he cannot fulfill the purpose and execute the strategy if there's nobody like Stephanus and his household, if there's nobody like Tychicus, if there's nobody like Philemon, if there's nobody like Phoebe, if there's nobody like uh, Priscilla and Aquila and folks like that. He cannot execute, he cannot fulfill the purpose, he cannot execute the strategy if there aren't people who are embracing what he's doing understanding what he's doing, seeing the eternal value in what he's doing, okay, and are willing to become and partner with Paul as helpers and fellow laborers in the work of the ministry. So, you look at that verse there, and I would just say, what are, what are we allowing ourselves to be addicted to? What are, we, what are we allowing ourselves to be addicted to that is of no eternal value? Now, I'm not saying, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying you can never watch a Cubs game. I'm not saying you can never watch, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever. I, I, I'm not saying that you can't garden if you like to garden. I'm not saying that you can't, you know, but we have to have these things in balance, Right? And these things can vary easily. You ever, you ever see people that can recite the stats off of every Topps baseball card from 1987, but they can't remember a dang reference in the Bible? That was me when I was probably 10. Okay? What are we addicted to? What are we allowing to occupy our time and attention in a way that has become inordinate? Okay? 
Are we making decisions in our lives based upon the eternal value? Remember, I, remember a few weeks ago I talked about the difference between celestial and terrestrial thinking? Remember that? Okay? These, these folks here, the household of Stephanus there, they had addicted themselves. They had taken that dedication, they had taken that, and they had said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take this and we're going we're to put it toward the ministry. That's what we're going to do. Okay? It might not be easy, it might not always be fun, but there's going to be eternal value in it. And I'm not saying, again, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that you can't have you know, things in your life that you enjoy and so on and so forth. But I do know this, those things that you enjoy, if you're not careful, can take you. They can ensnare you, and your deceptive brain messages about those things will lie to you about what really is going on. Or that negative self-talk, about how you view yourself, you know what I'm talking about, right? It'll, it'll compete with the truth of God's Word in your life. It'll tell you you're not adequate. It'll tell you you're not really saved. It'll tell you that, that you need to, that, whoa, before you, before you can be like the household of Stephanus, what you need to do is you need to get yourself in order. And then once you've got yourself in order and you have everything cleaned up just so, then you can be of value to God. No. When you got saved, He fixed everything that was wrong with your inner man. Did He save you? Did He justify you? Did He redeem you? Did He make you accepted in the Beloved? Did He seal you in Christ? Does His Holy Spirit live inside your heart? Yeah. So the problem is not with any of that. The problem is, is with taking that life, that life of Christ that's in you, that's already there because He put it there, and appropriating it into your mortal flesh. Okay? But your, your negative self-talk, it'll tell you that you're not worthy and this and that. Can I just tell you that if you, I'm telling you from experience, if you think that you have to have everything in your life just so before you can do ministry, you'll never do anything. Okay. And what the enemy is going to do is, you know, he'll come along and he'll seize on that stuff and he'll say, hey, listen, you weren't very gracious with your kids just now. Maybe you really shouldn't be preaching. Hey, listen, you weren't very gracious with your wife or your husband. Maybe you really shouldn't be this, that, or the other thing. But here we have these saints that addicted themselves to the work of the ministry. This doesn't mean they were all preaching. This doesn't mean they were all teaching. But they were functioning in such a way that they had the ministry at the forefront of their decision-making process. Okay? I don't even think it means that every time the church doors were open, as it were, they were there as a legalistic rule. But it means that as they were analyzing their life, as they were thinking about their life, as they were making decisions about their life, and where they were going to go, and how they were going to use their time, and their talent, and their effort, and their resources, that they had placed the ministry first. Not first, but at the top of the, near the top of the list. And they were evaluating those things. And Paul says now in verse 16, he says, he beseeches them in 15 to beseech to, sorry, to submit themselves unto folks who are functioning with that mentality. And then he moves, as we move on into verse 17, he says, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus. And I don't know how to say his name. How do you say his name? See, you don't know how to either. So however I say it will be good. This is, what I, this is what I say to my students at school. However I say it's right, okay? <laughs> he says... So he says, I'm glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have what? You know what that tells me? That tells me that Paul needed something from those people. Those people supplied something to Paul that Paul needed. Can I just say something? You never know 
the value that you add to the body of Christ. Unless somebody tells you. Now you know sort of you know from God's Word that you're a member in particular, 1 Corinthians 12. You know these things. You know that you have worth, value, and that He's tempered the body together how He's seen fit. You know those things, right? But you never know how you are impacting or benefiting or how somebody really might need it, have needed that thing that you just gave them unless you are telling another saint that stuff. Look at the verse. I'm glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have what? Supplied. Now look at the next verse. For they have done what? Refresh my spirit. Paul needed some, spirit, some spiritual refreshment. Not in the sense of his standing before God, but in the sense of his own psychological state and well-being. And here these believers come from Corinth, the three that are mentioned there in verse 17, and they in verse 17, they, they are able to give Paul something that he's lacking. They're, they're able to supply him with something that he's lacking, and the result of that in verse 18 is that they've refreshed his what? I had a situation just... Um, Last week, where actually twice during the month of August, where some somebody that I knew was passing through Michigan. Somebody I don't get to see people I don't get to see very often. They live in other states and other places. But I know them. I know I have I've had fellowship with them in the past. And as they were passing through Michigan, they stopped at our house. Okay? And in stopping at our house, they left. And when they left, there was a refreshment, right? There was a there, there had been a there had been a spiritual thing that had been stirred in me and in them and in my wife and in and, and, and in the, the the other wife there as there was fellowship and discussion around God's word, okay? And all sorts of things related to it, right? But Paul says there in verse 18 that that he had been refreshed in his what? I would encourage you, and I'm, gonna t I'm, I'm talking to myself here as much as I am anybody else, we need to be more mindful of telling other saints that we appreciate what they do. That we appreciate what they bring to our lives and to the table. To the value that they add, not just to our individual lives, but to the ministry by and large. And we have to get past this idea that we have to have everything. Folks, if you're waiting for yourself to never do anything wrong before you get involved, you're never going to do anything. Because the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, and Paul says, so that you cannot do the things that you would. How many times do you end up doing the exact thing you don't want to do? Right? Right? So here he is, he's talking about how, how these, this, th th this is a picture of where I want to go with this bodybuilding stuff that we're going to get into in a couple weeks. He says in verse 18, they have refreshed my spirit. The coming of these believers from Corinth to Paul refreshed Paul in his spirit. Okay? He says, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. And now we have the, the, the sort of the culmination comment here, if you will. He says, at the end of verse 18, he says, therefore, here it is. What's he say? Acknowledge. What does it mean to acknowledge? It means, if you're going to acknowledge it, it means you're going to be mindful of it, and you're going to point it out, and you're going to say something about it, right? He says, acknowledge them that are what? Such. Okay, who are these people that are such that he wants them to acknowledge? They're the ones back in verse 16, therefore, excuse me, that ye submit yourselves unto, unto such. You see that phrase in verse 16? He says, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Now you get verse, six, eight, verse 18, therefore acknowledge ye them that are what? 
Them that are such are the households of Stephanus of the world, if you will. Okay? They're the, they're the, they're the fortune, Fortunatuses. They're the people that he's talking about in this, in this passage. And the ones that have refreshed his spirit and, 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 and brought comfort and consolation to him with the different things that are going on. And he says, we need to acknowledge this. We need to be mindful of this. We need to not just take it for granted. And I know in my heart that we do that. Don't we? We take for granted things. How many of you have ever given any thought to the fact that when you walk in here on a Sunday morning, the lights are on and the heat's on? You just take it for what? The coffee's made, the donuts are out, the bulletins are ready. Well, somebody, that, did, that didn't just happen on its own. Some saints did that. Thank you for what you guys do. The music. How do you think, how do you think the songs we're going to sing get sung? Somebody had to what? They had to decide what we're going to sing. They had to practice it. During the week, you know, I, I, think, I think of Isaac learning to play the drums, right? He doesn't just roll up in here and start banging on the drums in a meaningful way to help the song. He's doing what at home? He's practicing, right? And there's a hundred more, more things that go on like that in this assembly all the time that we're just sort of like, yeah, yeah, well, we just take it what? For granted, all right? Maybe we shouldn't do that. You know, I think there's a balance to this, right? You don't want to be like so over the top complimentary that you, may, that you make people feel uneasy that way. But we need to acknowledge the things that different folks are what? Doing. Because all those little things, do they add value? I know I'm sounding like an economist now, okay? Value added. What are you doing? What are you doing to add value? Well, God is, every one of you has talents, every one of you have skills, every one of you have different things that you're good at, okay? I've used this illustration before. You know, you, you give me a car and tell me to fix it, I'm not going to have any idea. But there's some of you in here that are really good at that. You give me a book and tell me to read it and tell you what it's about, I can do that. I can do that and I can, I can understand, and I can see from God's Word, and I can try to put things together. That's what I'm good at. That's why I'm doing this, not something else. Right? But all of these things, he says, at the end of verse, he says, therefore acknowledge ye them that are what? Such. Them who are functioning in this way and in these capacities. So in conclusion, I would just ask two questions. Okay? And I don't want you to say anything out loud, but I would just simply say, what are we addicted to? In our lives, what are, we, what are we addicted to? Either in the realm of things that are really those things that we shouldn't be because they're sinful. Okay? You know, you can be addicted to hating people. You can be addicted to... You can be addicted to jealousy... You can be anything that Paul's mentioning in Galatians chapter 5 is a work of the flesh. You can get addicted to it. What are we addicted to in that capacity? What are we addicted to in terms of things that just pull our attention away from eternal things? And what are we addicted to in the sense of ministry? And last, simply just a challenge for all of us as saints to be more mindful of acknowledging the value added to the body of Christ by other people. The refreshment of spirit that we get from fellowship. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. This is why Going off and living your spiritual life on an island by yourself where you're not going to interact and you're not going to do this and I'm going to get all my teaching from the internets. 
Okay? And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be a part of that. You are depriving yourself of something, and you are depriving the body at large of something. Because that's not the way the body of Christ was tempered. And I'm not talking about somebody who lives in the middle of nowhere or is sick, infirmed, and shut in, and the only way they can get sound doctrine is by watching us on the internet or watching our videos or this kind of thing. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about saints who say or make the choice that I'm not going to be a part, I'm not going to, because, be, be, because for whatever the reason is, they're depriving themselves and the body of the benefit that the body of Christ has from them being a part of the ministry. I hope you'll just consider these things. I've often said, I've said it already about a few weeks ago, sometimes, man, we look at these, we look at these verses as Paul's winding this stuff down, and we tend to view them as throwaway. Right? Ah, eh, well, he's just saying goodbye. You ever watch people socially? How many times do I say goodbye? <laughs> goodbye. I'm leaving this time. Seriously. And something up, oh, and then you get, then you're right back into it, right? My kids complain about this, you know. I remember complaining about it about my parents, right? My point is, we are meant as members of the body of Christ to be members one of another, not lone rangers. And these, these verses that we often think of just throwaway are sometimes, I have found, some of the hardest verses to read and really think about what is he getting at. And in some cases, they read my meter more than other things do because of, the, because of what's really there if you want to pay attention. So, next Sunday, we're going to have a busy Sunday. We're going to say goodbye to Nate and Kristen. The kids are going to move up if they're eligible, and we're going to move on into another school year, and the ministry is going to continue. And I appreciate all of the people that help, that do things around the assembly, and I just it's my prayer that we'll consider what are we addicted to and being more mindful of telling others that we appreciate them. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time together that we could spend in your word. We, we think about the fact that we were meant as a body to live in community with other believers. In order to be a helper, you have to be with somebody helping. In order to be a fellow laborer, you need to be somebody who is laboring together on the same thing. Not off doing your own thing. In order to be a fellow servant, we need to be about the same things. And we think about Paul talking about being minded in such a way that the mind of Christ, that we function with the mind of Christ there in Philippians chapter 2. We're grateful for all the saints here that partake in the ministry and that help the ministry, that add value to the ministry, that, that, that serve in, the, in, the, in their own capacities, that they serve in, and we, we pray that as we look at the assembly and we see needs, and we see things that need to, be, um, need to be accomplished and so forth, that we'll be able to step up and see that those things are taken care of. We're grateful for the time that we could spend together in your word this morning. We ask this in Christ's name.